here, uh, precious words that encourage us as to God's working and God's will and God's purpose to have a people for his name, yeah. to enable them, to equip them, and establish them in these things. Now you remember that brother, our, our brother Isaiah was speaking midway between the one who, whom God used to give us the law and the one whom God used to fulfill that law. Uh, I don't know that we would call that midway point a watershed, but it is uh, a, a significant point uh, in my thinking to, to because of the uh, the uh, extent uh, of the things, the, the reach, if you will, of the things that Brother Isaiah says to us about this one who has come, and yet he reaches back to the things that have been spoken beforehand, to recall them and to stir us up by thinking about those things that have been revealed in the past as a foundation. Oh Lord, I want to read the first part of this uh, what we call chapter 25 to begin with. O oh Lord, thou art my God. I will exalt thee. I will praise thy name, for thou hast done wonderful things. Thy counsels of old are faithfulness and truth. Oh, that's uh, th those words about God's counsel of faithfulness and truth stirs the heart. Amen. Uh, God does not change yep. down through the ages, down through the generations. He doesn't have to change. He's the one who moves all things and makes all things work together. Yeah. God's not just looking, we know, for, for a time and a space to, to insert himself or to assert himself. He makes the time. Amen. And he makes the places and he sets the people in their places. And he, and he brings those things to pass as he intends. Just as uh, he did in the days of Noah with the flood, just as he did with uh, Joseph in Egypt. God has shown Pharaoh, Joseph said, what he's about to do. Seven years of plenty, seven years of nothing. Just cuts it off. So God asserts himself in that way at the times that he has, at the times that he has appointed. And of course the people that he has appointed as he brought Brother Joseph out of the dungeon in one day. By counsels of old are faithfulness and truth. So, so we, can, we can anchor our souls in those things, as the Spirit says there in Hebrews uh, chapter 5. We anchor our soul there. I'm sorry, Hebrews chapter, yeah, chapter 10. Anchor our soul there, knowing that it will not move. It, the, 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 the place where we have set our anchor, if you will, the anchor of faith, is not going to change. It's not going to be pulled up, as our Savior said in the parable there of the... Uh, of the builder of the house on sand and a rock. The winds and the wave and the storm descended and the house did not fall because it was built upon the rock. So the prophet stirs up our thinking here, praising God's name and exalting him in the wonderful things he has done. I, when I hear that word wonderful, Brother Aaron was talking about wonderful earlier in our opening. When I hear that word wonderful, the first thing I think of is wonder. It's, it's striking. Yeah. It, it draws your attention. It yeah. holds your attention. You, you've, got a, you've got a large space there to think, uh, if you will, to think about what's been portrayed to you, to think about what's been revealed. Uh, you can come back to it again and again and again as we talk about ruminating on something and, and uh, meditating on something. And that, that truth and that reality that's been revealed and that's, and that's been worked in the earth uh, provokes us and stirs us up and establishes us. Thy counsels of old are faithfulness and true. And then he goes on in verses, uh, let's say, 2 through 5. I, 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 I told Sister Emily I was going to let her read the good part of the text, and I'm reading the bad part. Well, this is the bad part, okay? For thou hast made of a city a heap of a defense city, a ruin, a palace of strangers to be no city. It shall never be built. Think Babel. Yeah, it shall never be built. See, God can assert himself against something that men may want to do, that men may plan, that men may desire, that men may uh, assert themselves to do. Well, uh, n n nothing stands against God's will. Amen. 
Nothing stands when God, see this is part of his, uh, his faithfulness and truth and his counsel. He's showing and demonstrating these things. That men may have certain desires, but it's the will of God that's Amen. established. One of the other prophets says it's, it's, it's God's will that's established. That's what will stand, as the old hymn says, over the wrecks of time. Yeah. So it shall never be built. Therefore shall the strong people glorify thee, and the city of the terrible nations shall fear thee. Think Nineveh. Yeah. The prophet went through the city for three days announcing its destructions, and they glorified God. They feared him in ashes and sackcloth. Uh -huh. Even the king, even the animals turned toward him. The strong people the t and the city of the terrible nations. For thou hast been a strength to the poor, a strength to the needy in his distress, a refuge from the storm, a shadow from the heat, when the blast of the terrible ones is as a stor storm against the wall. See, God uh, asserts himself for his people, for those who belong to him. Of course, he's doing it for his name. He's doing it to establish that he is Lord of all, that he's... Uh, that all of these things are in his hand, they're under his jurisdiction, yeah, yeah. that no other power is as his power, that he can extend his power where he pleases, when he pleases, how he pleases, over whom he pleases. And see, this is, this is part of the name of the Lord that he's established down through the generations, down through the centuries, so that men would fear his name, so that he would then be justified. Amen. When men turn away from him, which, the, which generations have done, generation after generation after generation, has rejected this testimony that God has given in the earth. And they've acted as though it was just some kind of circumstance. Well, that was just, a, uh, that was, that was just something that happened, uh, just some accident of history or something like that. But God works these things. And unless you have faith, men don't know. Yeah. They don't understand that this is God working these things. Nebuchadnezzar had to learn that lesson the hard way, didn't he? And others didn't. Well, his, uh, we know he's his grandson, Belshazzar. Is it Belteshazzar or Belshazzar, Judah? Belshazzar. Belshazzar, okay. Judah's corrected me at work several times when I got those two names mixed up. He, he did not learn that lesson. Daniel said that. You saw these things as he was interpreting the handwriting on the wall. You saw these things, and yet you have chosen to drink wine from the, from the uh, cups that were used to serve him. You thought you could use them to serve yourself. This night your kingdom is taken from you and it shall be divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. And within hours Belshazzar was dead. And Daniel was elevated. Oh, he thought he was going to elevate Daniel, make him third ruler in the kingdom. Well, he didn't get to, did he? He didn't get to. So this is what happens to those who, uh, who assert themselves against the Lord God while ones like Joseph and Daniel are elevated. They're protected, they're watched over, they're provided. The poor of the earth receive strength. The needy in their distress receive what they need. They have a refuge from the storm, a shadow from the heat, and the blast of the, uh, and the, and the blast of the, of the, I'm sorry, the shadow of the, yeah, the shadow of the cloud and the branch of the terrible one shall be brought low. God takes them down. Though they exalt themselves and they think they're strong in themselves, uh, with, with just a move, the Lord God can take them down. Either personally, they can just be stricken down in their shoes, yeah. in their boots, so to speak, where they stand as uh, Ananias and Sapphira were. Thou shalt bring down the noise of the strangers as the heat in a dry place, even the heat with the shadow of a cloud, the branch of the terrible ones shall be brought low. So God is the one who's watching over all of these things. And men like Nebuchadnezzar, or like Moses' Pharaoh, may think they can exalt themselves. Who is the Lord? That Pharaoh said. You remember there's five or six Pharaohs in the scripture record. And he's the one who said, who is the Lord that I should obey him? I know not the Lord. Well, he didn't. And he refused to learn. He just refused. It's a, it's a staggering thing when you think about this man asserting himself against these powers again and again and again and again like a storm against the wall. And of course the storm can't move the wall. It doesn't move the wall. So we have this testimony then 
of what God is working in the earth, these wonderful things, his counsels of faithfulness and truth upon which his people can depend. And, and, and God works among the nations, moving them like chess pieces around in different places. Daniel has this, uh, gives this testimony again, but, but the Lord had been working that long before Daniel's time. It's just kind of like Daniel uh, is, is shown uh, this testimony to, to uh, a, as, a, as a digest, if you will, in just a few words to affirm that this is the way God works. And, of course, he was going to do that in significant ways during that four to five hundred year period after Daniel. It was going to be done in significant ways to set up. I was just setting up the fullness of time. Making all things ready for when this promised one, this son and child, that brother Aaron read that text from, from the prophet, would enter into the earth, would enter into Israel, and be established as the one that God was going to work in. So, so the, these words here in verses 2 through 5 are part of God's wonderful things. They're the, they're the uh, expression of his counsels of faithfulness and truth. Now it didn't go well with those folk, did it? Again and again and again. A whole generation of Noah was swallowed up and all were gone except for those eight souls whom God had chosen and prepared in the ark and watched over and provided for them until it rested in, the, in, in its chosen and appointed place and the waters abated and God opened the door and they went out and began to repopulate the earth. And again and again and again, uh, whether we're talking about Abraham and the, and the, uh, the kings that came against the cities of the plain and Abraham took his 300 and some men and wiped out those armies and took all the took all the captives back and brought all the booty back well God was watching God was providing for that that was no small thing we don't even know how many but it was it was five some kings with their prepared and equipped and experienced armies that the that, that these uh, tribes of some 300 Bedouins who lived in tents wiped them out and chased them out of the countryside. It's just one of the ways that God worked in those, in those generations to establish himself, establish his name, so that, for instance, 40 years after Israel came out of Egypt, they sent the spies into Jericho, and what was Rahab saying? We've heard, we've heard 40 years later and they were still terrified. The city was shut up. This great city with walls that 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 could not be impregnate or could, could not be a, a broken down, penetrated. Yes, thank you. That could not be penetrated uh, by ordinary human means. They uh, the, the, they were they were shivering in their boots with good reason. Yeah. And it didn't do them any good. All God had his people do was march around the city. And then he broke it down. See? So God can assert himself in any way that he pleases. And we've had some experience with that here, haven't we? In providing this facility for us this day. Without, it, without, it, without cost to us, without, it was just granted to us. We didn't even ask, did we? It was just granted to us. Verse 6 text that Sister Emily read. I'm sorry, Emma read. I'm going to have a hard time getting that Emily and Emma straightened out here for a while. And in this mountain shall the Lord of hosts make unto all people a feast of fat things. I'm going to turn over here to the beginning of Isaiah's record where it says, It shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains, shall be exalted above the hills, all nations shall flow into it. Many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He'll teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his path. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So that's the context of this mountain. See, when the prophet speaks about it here. And in this mountain shall the Lord of hosts make unto all people a feast of fat things. He's doing this. He's providing for those who, well, as our master said, hunger and thirst for righteousness. 
He's setting a table for them, as Brother David says, setting a table for them in the presence of their enemies. Yeah. yeah. Unto all people a feast of fat things, a feast of wine on the leaves, of fat things full of marrow, of wine, wines on the leaves, well refined. What God provides is more than adequate. Amen. It's an abundance. That's right. Even as the Savior, when he multiplied the fish and the bread, well, what'd they take up? Baskets full, Praise didn't God. they? They had one little lunch, and they took up baskets full after thousands had been fed. Praise All that they wanted. They took up baskets full. So when, when God provides, it is abundant. As, as, again, the Master said, he came to give life abundantly. Abundantly. So that's what he does. So that's why when we, when we meet together and speak about these things, very often uh, we recall, uh, there's a lot of texts that we recall on a regular basis, don't we? Some of us brothers preach and teach from those texts again and again and again, but there's plenty there, yeah. isn't there? Yes. There's plenty more that we could recall and, and stir up our thinking and, and uh, the, uh, this uh, interconnectedness, this uh, Brother Given likes to use that word synergy, of the truth, the way the different parts of it uh, are connected, and the the different the, the sum of the different parts is a lot more than the whole. That's that's why, because this truth is like is it, like the uh, uh, one of the first visions that Ezekiel saw of the chariot thrown with the wheel in the middle of the wheel, all working together in ways that it it it, it didn't it didn't make sense from a human and an earthly and a physical perspective. Well, that's because we're not talking about human, earthly, and physical things, are we? We're talking about the Most High Amen. and His uh, His eternal truth, the everlasting things that He's made known, things that have always been true. They just haven't been revealed. As you've heard me say a lot over the years, it's written because it's true. It's not true because it's written. These things are true. God's just revealing them. And, and uh, those of us who believe, of course, we get to sit at the table. We get to eat. We get to imbibe these things. Amen. And these things that we eat and drink, of course, become part of us. Amen. They really do become part of us. That's how we think. It's how we talk. Yeah. It affects what we do. This is why uh, Brother Paul can talk about the parts of our body as instruments of righteousness. They used to be instruments of wickedness, yeah. but now they're instruments of righteousness because our hearts and our minds have been changed. Amen. We're continually being uh, equipped and enabled and, and uh, uh, more firmly established so that we can give ourselves where the Lord directs us, yeah. just as, uh, as uh, Brother Paul and Brother Silas uh, went out on that second journey and they started one direction. The Lord said, don't go that way. They started, went another direction, don't go that way. So they just continued. And they were ready. They were ready for God's leading. When Brother Paul got that, saw that vision of the man from Macedonia saying, come over and help us, they just went. They just went, not knowing. Not knowing what would happen. And they weren't surprised when they were beaten in the street after a while. They weren't surprised either at casting out the demon, casting the demon out of the girl that led to the beating in the street and being thrown into the... They weren't surprised at that at all. They were fully prepared to pay that price. Yeah. My goodness, Brother Paul had arrested and had others beaten, hadn't he, for this name. And the Lord had revealed to him that he was going to suffer much for his name. So he was fully prepared for that. See? So God equips and enables us by the nourishment that he provides so that we can deal with these matters as they arise. It's all, just, it's all part of living by faith and walking in the Spirit. It's all part of that, the, the nature of that thing, of that uh, atmosphere and that involvement that we have. And verse 7 says, He will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering cast over all people and the veil that is spread over all nations. He's opened up his truth and the light has come in as we... Uh, now, the, the day of the open heavens there in the, in the book of Revelation. A door opened in heaven and a voice said, come up here. Yeah. So we can, we, we can look into these things. These things have been made known to us in the preaching of our brethren, the apostles and prophets in the spirit. Brother Paul, we mentioned this. I taught from this text the other, other evening here in Titus, uh, chapter 1 and verses 1 through 3, where he, uh, he talks about uh, his assignment, his personal commission, if you will, 
in the hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began, but hath in due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me, to the co according to the commandment of God our Savior. And Brother Bob in our lesson this morning cited the Robert in that uh, text in, in Ephesians 3, where Paul talks about the ministry that had been given to him to open these things up and to declare these things and to... Uh, uh, to announce and to teach and to, to establish the believers in these things. The face of the covering cast over all people. Their eyes and ears covered, not able to see, but now by uh, God's will and God's purpose, He's opened up our ears to hear, granted us a hearing, opened our eyes to see, yes. strengthened our weak and feeble knees, straightened out our our, our bent hands and arms and fingers so we can take hold of these things. Amen. Take hold of the things that for which we've been taken hold of. We can involve ourselves and engage these things. Spread over all nations. Even to us. Even to us here in this place. Us Gentiles here in this place and in this time. In a land that is uh, swallowed up by its own desires and worships and serves its own desires and glorifies and magnifies its own desires rather than glorifying and magnifying the truth and the will of God. He will swallow up death in victory. The Lord God will wipe away tears from off all faces and the rebuke of his people he shall take away from off all the earth for the Lord has spoken it. God is cleansed and purifying a people for his own possession so that he, so that he can now by the power of his son's indestructible life, he can receive us into his presence. Because, as we talked about this morning, we're connected, brother. I think it's Brother Ricky that mentioned how many times this, this phrase, some 70 times, in Christ, is in the writings of the apostles and prophets there. Because we're connected to him. We're in him, and he's in us. And that's why we're received. See, these are the things that have been worked out. This is what God has planned all along to do. And of course, it's taken him all. It took him all those centuries to get everything, if you want to say it this way, get everything lined up in its proper place, so that then the son could be revealed, the child could be made known, whom he had sent into the earth. And he went about doing good, healing those oppressed of them, revealing who he was, showing even those who were not willing to believe who he was. They had to testify. They, they, had to, they had to confess his power like the demons did. They had to confess his power. He had power over things that when Jesus said, by whom do your sons cast them out? Well, their sons weren't casting any out. But he was. And they still refused. It's a stunning thing. You think about the hardness of, of the religious heart. The fleshly religious heart. How hard it can become. Simply because they want to protect their place. Yeah and the things that have been handed down to them because they're unwilling to move. They don't understand the faithfulness and truth of God is first of all to himself. Amen. And to the things that cannot be shaken. The things that cannot be moved. Well, they had to admit the temple could be shaken and moved. It had been taken down in the days of Jeremiah, hadn't it? And of course Jesus declared, the Savior announced to his apostles, it was going to come down again. And it's never been established again. Remember how Jeremiah wrote that there was a day coming when the Ark of the Covenant would not come to mind? Now he meant that that article of furniture would not come to mind. It was, it was not restored. It was not restored to the, uh, to the most holy place. He will swallow up death and victory this is what he's done. This is what's been announced. This is what Brother Peter declared on the day of Pentecost. That God had done. Swallowed up death in victory. He just got up. When the time came, his life returned to his body. And he walked out. And again, he didn't, he didn't go to his enemies and announce, Here I am again. You tried to take me down, but I'm back. No, he didn't. No. They refused him. They were not going to get that honor. There were chosen witnesses who saw him and were appointed to declare these things. There were some others who saw him, just for, uh, just for good measure, you might say. So Brother Paul could point out there in 1 Corinthians 15 that more than 500 brethren saw him alive. Some of them are still alive, he said. But the physical evidence is not the point. 
as the Savior said, blessed is he who is not seen and yet believed. So we're of that number. Amen. We've not seen. Brother Peter mentions that. Mentions, we've not seen him physically. We've not touched him. We've not heard his voice with our physical ears, but we have heard his voice. Amen. And we have seen his form. Amen. And we have believed the things that he has said and done that God has fulfilled in him in swallowing up death in victory. Wiping away tears. The tears that struck us when first we were convicted of the things of which we were guilty. But then we heard the good news that those things could be wiped away. Those things, we could be purified of those things. Our, re, our own rebuke could be taken off the earth because God has spoken these things. This is what God set for himself to do. This is what he's established in the earth. When we gather together in our assemblies several times a week, these are the things about which we speak. These are the things that we recall. These things that God has done in faithfulness and truth. He has justified himself. First of all, it's, he himself has been satisfied, as Brother Isaiah would say later. He shall see the suffering of his soul and be satisfied. He first had to be satisfied. God had to be just, and then he became the justifier of those of us who believe. He spoke these things. He accomplished these things. He fulfilled these things. So let's conclude by the reading of this last verse here. Verse 9, it shall be said in that day, Lo, this is our God. Yes. We have waited for him. Amen. And he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice yeah. in his salvation. Praise God. So when we meet together, brethren, that's the focus of our assembly. Amen. That's what we speak about. It's what we sing about. These are the things we, uh, uh, among the things that we pray about in yeah. gratitude, in giving thanks, in remembrance, and stirring one another up. The salvation that he has accomplished. We're glad and rejoice in his salvation because we know that uh, despite good old American can do, we're, we can do it. <laughs> Politically speaking, socially speaking, economically speaking, we're not able to. Even the things, even the, the comfortable and affluent things that we have here in this land, they're all tenuous. Yeah. They can be taken away very quickly, can't they? Right. All we have to have is one direct hit from a whirlwind. That's right. We call them tornadoes. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, Brother Job's children were taken in a whirlwind. Mm -hmm. And then there was a whirlwind of other events that took all the rest of his possessions. Yeah. And he ended that one day, in one day. Yeah. All of these things gone. Yeah. All of these things gone. But the things that God has granted us in his faithfulness and his truth, those things can't be shaken. So that's why we've turned our back on the world as a, as a place to anchor our soul. We don't anchor our soul here. Well, we use the things that we have. We do. We use them for him. We honor him with them. Certain things, or some things we won't touch. They're unclean. And we certainly won't expose ourselves to being ensnared by things because we've denied ourselves. We've taken up our cross and followed after him. There were those in the scripture who had uh, an abundance of goods, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They had an abundance of goods. Joseph did. Daniel certainly was a powerful man. David, powerful man, wealthy, all that he amassed for uh, to himself, though, at the end of his life, was really devoted for building this place for God's, for the Ark of the Covenant yeah. and for God's presence among them. So he, he understood. He wasn't amassing these things for himself, unlike his son did. See, that's part of what snared him, was his great wealth that God granted him. But, of course, uh, uh, his wisdom was limited. Yeah. And so those things ended up owning him yeah. more than he owned them. We're not snared by those kinds of things. God may grant us an, uh, uh, an, abundance of, an abundance of things, but we want to be strong and able to use those things and not be snared and carried away and taken away by them. We want to always be able to say, this is our God for whom we have waited. He will save us. This is the Lord. We've waited for him. We've waited for him. So that's why we... Uh, we provoke and stir one another up in the manner that we do. 
exhort one another in this truth that will not forget as the uh, years of time go by all the experiences of life we pass through many favorable many unfavorable but they don't shake the things they don't shake us from the things that we believed see? we just prayed about not being shaken and being fully persuaded uh, that we'll not be separated from the love of God the love of God for his truth the love of God for his wisdom the love of God for his goodness and these other primary qualities of his own nature which he loves before he loves us <laughs> but see that nature includes loving us who have believed and who have trusted him who have fled to him for refuge from the wrath that is coming upon the world Amen. so brethren in closing tonight we want to exalt in him give thanks to him for these wonderful things and the counsels his counsel that he has done in faithfulness and truth and all these things that we've been able to recount one to another and stir one another up in his truth and his goodwill God's grace and peace brother, brother Michael you have the exhortation this evening who is it has the exhortation I don't have a brother Jason I'm sorry yes very good brother Jason <laughs>